All right, thank you all for coming. I'll just go ahead and uh, introduce our speakers so we can get right into the presentation. Uh, Ryan Reeves is the Supervising Engineer for DWR's Bay Delta Office, South Delta Management Section. Ryan has been in the Delta, Bay Delta Office for about eight years managing projects focused primarily on the evaluation and design of Salmonid diversion structures and Salmonid survival improvement strategies for the Sacramento River. Recent projects that Ryan has managed include the the floating fish guidance structure, uh, the bioacoustical fish fence pilot studies intended to reduce salmonid entrainment down Georgiana Slough. And Dave Smith is an ecologist with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, Research and Development Center. He is the team lead of the, cogn the cognitive ecology and ecohydraulics team where he applies models of fish movement in complex environments, conducts behavior, temperature, and toxicant stress studies using fish and leads the development of new and unique aquatic laboratory designs to inform mechanistic models of fish and human movement. So please welcome Ryan Reeves. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, so I'm going to start out with a little apology. If you guys were paying attention to the flyer that got sent out several weeks ago for this uh, brown bag, it, mentioned um, ELAM in the context of uh, Georgiana Slough, Georgiana Slough projects. We're actually not really going to talk very much about this Georgiana Slough specific projects. We do have a real project that we're going to showcase as part of this presentation, but it's going to be uh, uh, the, the focused on the Fremont Weir. Um, and uh, so um, anyway, just wanted to get that, get that out of the way. And, and with that, um, I'm going to spend the next few slides kind of uh, pulling you back away from away from ELAM and specific modeling tools and talk more about a, a context or suite of modeling tools and how ELAM um, fits into that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so ELAM is just, a, is just an acronym. You saw a different, um, different acronym at the beginning of, at the, on the first slide, um, uh, estimating likely animal movement. Here, a more uh, uh, nerdy um, uh, acronym is the Eulerian Lagrangian Agent Model. Basically, um, it's just a physics-based discipline that replaces a natural system with equations, which, uh, which allows us to convert these natural behaviors or patterns into, into, mathematical, um, into, into a mathematical uh, formula, which, which we can then draw conclusions about a natural system. Uh, and Dave's, that's really all I'm going to say about, uh, about the nuts and bolts of ELAM. I'm going to let Dave talk a lot more about it when, um, when we give the presentation over to him. Um, so this allows us to consider the question of, or, or what we're specifically using ELAM for is to consider the question of fish behavior in response to hydrodynamics or flow or different, different hydro, hydrodynamic phenomena that occur. Um, and before we get into a lot of that, uh, um, that detail, uh, like I just mentioned, we're going to take a step back and kind of look at this overall framework of, of using ELAM um, to evaluate uh, questions which I think we probably all, um, all work with uh, on a daily basis or at different times in our career. Um, when you look at the, the delta, big picture of the delta, um, you, you've got the, I've got the Sacramento River, um, here I'll use this pointer so that the people online can see. I've got the Sacramento River here outlined in green. This is typically considered and, and many studies show that this has the highest uh, survival of, um, uh, for, for salmonids, the uh, yellow areas through Georgiana Slough and uh, through the Delta Cross Channel that lead to the Central Delta tend to have much lower, um, lower survival. So if we're looking at uh, various projects um, in the Delta, which, uh, you know, which may have different um, intended outcomes or different feature changes, <clears throat> I've given some examples here like operating behavioral barriers at junctions, uh, changing salmonid entrainment at, at any of the junctions. Um, a, an outcome would be maximizing salmonid survival to Chips Island um, or modifying South Delta Water Project operations and also habitat restoration. These are all things that we're, um, you know, we could be implementing a project uh, for or and, and that we do implement projects um, uh, related to these things. I think um, um, all of us, uh, when, um, when we're tasked with something like this, it's you know you can focus on your specific your specific project and how you're and the steps to implement it. But um, and, and I think we all we all probably try to um, figure out how how other projects and other topics relate 
um, and, and what the trade-offs are and the priorities between these types of um, these projects. But really, if you think about it too much, it just it turns into a big angry ball of spaghetti and it's, it, it gets really complicated. So um, I'm here to uh, say that we've made a lot of progress over the last decade um, with modeling tool, with various modeling tools in untangling that, that ball of spaghetti and really coming up with a, a good quantitative um, uh, optimized project or uh, trade-offs or, or prioritization of projects. And so this is just a, a graphical um, representation of different modeling tools related to salmonid survival and kind of where, where they best fit in. Um, starting up here at ecological conceptual models, um, this is, of course, uh, as the name says, more of a conceptual type of framework. It's best used in a decisional type of project or screening level project. Um, life cycle models um, might take you one step uh, closer towards, uh, towards a probabilistic model and takes you a step um, away from, from a decisional, um, decisional type of project. Um, statistical mark recapture modeling, um, these are heavy, heavy probabilistic models and, um, and take you, take you close, closer to a, a system-wide type of analysis. Um, EPTM or enhanced BTM, PTM stands for particle tracking model. That's essentially a, a particle tracking model that has, has behavior added, added to the particles. Um, and that, uh, that takes you close into the, really into the system, system approach, um, combines a statistical and mechanistic uh, modeling approach. And then, um, and then from there you get down into, into ELAM. ELAM is really an engineering mechanistic model that uses fine scale behavior or fine, uh, fine scale analysis of behavior to come up with conclusions. Now there's certainly overlap between each of these tools. One can be used um, in place of another, um, but what, what's, what we're really trying to represent with this graph is to, is to, to uh, with this graphic, is to know, know where your project is on this scale and choose the right model or set, or really the right set of models to evaluate, evaluate your project and, and uh, prioritize it. So after that nice clean slide, you might think that's great, just a really pretty picture, but that's you know, a, a huge amount of development work for, to ever get to a spot where any of us could really use any of these tools. And um, so just bear with me, this, this is a little more complicated, but um, I'm basically trying to show that we're, we're really not that far away. In fact, we, I think we, we've, well, we have an example of, of a project that, that used uh, this, this integrated modeling framework um, uh, that Dave's going to talk about. So uh, let's start over here at available data. Um, we have acoustic telemetry, salmonid behavior, and survival data. Um, we all know uh, various studies that have that, um, but there, there's, a, there's a lot of that out there. Uh, both flow and large-scale hydraulic data. Um, we have the uh, CDEC continuous, continuously monitored network. That's a, a huge, uh, huge data source um, in the delta of, of this type of data. Um, there's also fine-scale hydraulic uh, turbulence data, um, and uh, and this is this is becoming more and more available. Then there's the uh, pretty standard uh, hydrodynamic modeling tools. You could plug in plug any um, any uh, uh, name in here. These are just examples of uh, various 1D, 2D, and 3D hydrodynamic models that are available. Um, basically, there's a iterative iterative it's iterative and and uh, uh, calibration feedback loop that goes on between, uh, between these models. Um, and, uh, and then from there, the, uh, the Salmonid behavior and survival modeling tools. Um, these are uh, kind of a repeat of the, of the, of the previous graphic, uh, starting with the life cycle models, statistical mark recapture models, EPTM model, and ELAM model. And um, so ideally there'd be feedback um, between each of them and, and between the hydro, whichever hydrodynamic model is appropriate for analysis, for the analysis that you're doing. Um, and really what we're showing, the, the other thing that we're showing here is um, these dark uh, red lines are connections that may not exist or are in, uh, under development um, between these models, um, where the, the thin gray lines are connections that are essentially established, well established. So you can see there's, there's 
you know, maybe it's about half and half, but really there's, there's a lot of gray lines out there. There's a lot of established connections between these models which are available to use. And a lot of the, um, the, the darker uh, red, orange uh, planned connections, they're, they're, they're really available if you have the right team, um, team of people to use. Um, so then this portion of the graphic really just kind of restates these um, actions, outcomes, or, or project types. Um, which, which may, be, uh, may be evaluated using these tools. Um, ideally, uh, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the work that's done by a particular team um, could be captured into a decision-making support uh, software or yeah, decision-making software similar to the CalSIM model if, uh, uh, that the Bay Delta office uses for water quality evaluations. I won't get too much into that, but that's, that's really a, that really, this is the only box in this figure that's, that hasn't really been developed yet with respect to salmonid behavior. So um, just a few uh, conclusions um, or recommendations if, uh, if it, it wasn't made clear already. Um, so when you're planning a project or, or considering which, to, which of these tools is appropriate, consider the real scale at which your project is intended to produce an outcome. If you're, if, you're, if you're really looking at a, you know, a, a structure that's going to change entrainment into a particular weir or, um, or hatchery or something, then, then an, a, a really fine-scale ELAM model might be the right one. But if you're looking at a fine-scale outcome or a fine-scale change that is intended to produce a, uh, a population scale um, uh, outcome, you might need to consider ELAM along with other, other tools which, have, which were discussed. Um, so from that, choose the appropriate modeling tool to plan, design, optimize your project. ELAM would certainly be one of those that you would want to consider. Um, and then consider trade-offs uh, and benefits that your project will have um, on the system or get from other projects. Um, and with that, I'll turn this over to Dave, and Dave can talk a lot more about the actual details of the ELAM model and give the, um, talk about the details of the, the project example which, which ELAM was used on. I think that Ryan has a, a really nice vision of how modeling can be useful, you know, to the Bay Delta in general, but also you have these same problems all across all across the United States. Uh, it's always it's always these trade-offs on scale, complexity, detail of information, the ability to process it to make you know informed decisions about infrastructure uh, or construction projects. Um, the, the concept of the Elam really came about. To, to help help with that question, um, it was a, an attempt to make something mechanistic that here you know generally is not considered a, a mechanistic problem. And and so the way that the way that we sort of go about this is is that all of us are either trained as engineers, psychologists. We all have a a, a field that we associate with at some degree, and uh, there are. Um, or standards of practice, and if you're an engineer, you start with Newton and the governing equations, and you can work from that to, you know, information about a system that you really don't have anything other than a gross description of, um, you know, because you, 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 have a, you have evidence that that's the way the world works. Uh, and so you start with your governing equations. It's almost always how you begin a problem. Um, an ecologist, on the other hand, might look at a system and say, well, I need data to describe the, the problem, and then we'll derive the governing equations after you have those data. Uh, the challenge is, is that when you need to develop a project, uh, say the notch that we're going to describe here at Fremont Weir, you can't collect data for systems that don't exist yet. And so you're always stuck with trying to apply existing data for a system that, that you can measure to a system that you're going to build at some point in the future, or you may want to build. The ELAM is one approach to help draw those two disciplines together in a way that I think respects the conventions and, and traditions of both uh, approaches while still giving you something useful. Um, all projects have objectives. In the case of the Fremont Weir, I, I want to I be real clear and, and say that this is not a magic bullet. You know, we've got a mechanistic approach to things, but it still requires uh, professional judgment and care on how it's applied. It's not just a turnkey for every project. Uh, 
Um, in the case of this EIS EIR process for the Fremont Weir, I viewed it very much as a planning study in the Corps of Engineers that has a specific connotation. Uh, planning is not engineering and design. Planning is not scientific development and hypothesis testing. Uh, planning is, is, is integration of information to help inform uh, decisions about projects. Um, uh, so the core draws a pretty distinct line between those kinds of things. The, the engineering design comes after you've selected, those of you who know the core, the tentatively selected plan, um, that comes after. Um, and so I tried to couch uh, this project in terms of relative entrainment, um, you know, between these alternatives, uh, also pretty standard and shouldn't, shouldn't raise any alarm bells with anybody. Um, but we also wanted to describe features of, the, of proposed notches that might enhance its uh, entrainment potential um, and develop enough information for the next phase so that when it comes time to actually do engineering design, you've got a solid footing to go forward. Um, we always start with 2D models as our, as our starting point for a lot of problems, and uh, you can have a lot of debate as to whether this was a, whether we have a 2D problem or a 3D problem and whether we need, you know, steady state or, trans, uh, trans, uh, or time varying type uh, simulations. Um, I'll say this about 2D models, uh, they're well grounded in science. Uh, we think after having done 3D models and 2D models at the Fremont, we're at Sacramento both, that we can get a lot of the information that was needed from 2D, even though we realize and recognize that we are ignoring certain aspects of the system. Um, you know, thinking back to your project objectives, we knew there was going to be multiple alternatives. And one of the trade-offs you make on all of this is if you try to go in with maximum detail at the beginning, you inherently are going to limit your ability to look at the breadth of alternatives at the end. So we started with 2D. I think the results are useful. Um, something that I think sets our approach apart a little bit is that we're trying to describe the world from the perspective of the animal that's in it. It's a Lagrangian perspective. Um, and we use some simple algorithms to trigger behaviors. These algorithms are numerous in the literature. Uh, they come from a variety of sources. Um, and essentially all that they're doing is you're tracking stimulus over time for each individual fish and implementing behaviors. And those, those behaviors are calibratable. And so that's, that's why we have comparisons to data. Um, in the case of Fremont Weir, uh, in, in juxtaposition to say someplace like Georgiana Slough, the suite of behaviors that we see there in a broad stroke appear to be relatively straightforward. Uh, and so the data was very informative from that perspective as well. Um, in addition to the, the cognition aspect of our approach, we, we try to crudely represent the sensory system of the fish. Uh, you know, if you get into details, fish are infinitely complex. Multiple ways of sensing the world, we're looking at lateral lines. And so ba basically we treat a fish as having this lateral line that that uh, show does not show. The lateral line basically is a series of points that's embedded in this computational mesh of the 2D model. Information comes in at that scale, it's processed, and the behavior is implemented, and you move forward another another iteration. Uh, one one outcome of that is is that like with real fish, size matters, and bigger fish have bigger lateral lines, and therefore implement the same behaviors in the same environment differently. So. That's just a, an interesting thing that we see. Um, this is just your standard quadrant chart that we all remember from, from geometry when we were kids. Um, we believe that, that salmon implement quadrant four, which is uh, down in the lower right-hand corner. So basically what you're seeing here is the default behavior that is the bulk of the activity that's it's there in the middle, and then as behaviors are implemented, all we're doing is trading off movement decisions against the bulk uh, or the local velocity gradient. And if you're a salmon that's trying to swim downstream uh, and, and make good time doing it, we, we maintain that you don't want to be near the banks or the bed of the river, and you don't want to be uh, in proximity to large you know, sources of free shear, like a rock or a bridge pier or something like that. By implementing quadrant four type rules, you, you tend to steer away from those. Um, this has, been, this has been checked against data a, a number of times. The, the hypothesis seems reasonable. Uh, it also is extensible to other quadrants, which brings up interesting observations for other types of fish and uh, behaviors. But I wanted you to just kind of see that there is a, there is a framework. Um, as I said, I think at Georgiana Slough, you're going to see 
a bit more behavior in our model than you are at Fremont Weir. So this was the project site that, that was described. Uh, I think all of, everybody here is familiar with the Fremont Weir in, in short. The idea here is to put a hole, a notch in the weir that will let more water through that weir or over that weir uh, for a longer period of time to help salmon uh, get from the river out onto the floodplain. Um, it's a two mile long uh, concrete structure and uh, as soon as you decided that you want to put a notch and the question comes up, how big and where? What should it look like? Those are all just basic fundamental uh, project implementation questions and what we did to help address that was implement this workflow. This isn't quite as neat as the workflow that Ryan just showed you, but concurrently there were a number of steps that were going on. I think what I want to emphasize today is that we were able to uh, take line drawings that were developed as part of the EIS EIR process. Uh, these are just simple CAD drawings that came from the Department of Water Resources. Uh, integrate that with the local LIDAR data of the landscape as well as the bathymetry of the channel and create a, a new spatial domain, if you will, that captured the, what that notch looked like. And then we ran water through it and created a flow field that, that followed by fish in the model. And we were able to make estimates of entrainment rates as a function of all of those features. And you end up with, at the end, uh, entrainment rates by alternative across a range of stages, uh, allowing you to uh, parse things out a little bit. And one of the things that we tried to do was to represent alternatives that were too small to really consider, a thousand CFS notch, for example, and maybe too large to consider, uh, so that we had an envelope of information around the sweet spot that the project thought they had a shot at implementing. And um, and so those those lines you see on the, the Elam for notches graph represents those outcomes. We'll we'll have another slide to cover those. Um, there were a lot of supporting tools, and you can imagine to implement that workflow took, took a lot of different talents and skills. Uh, one of the things that I was real happy with was is that we were able to take those line drawings and make these models uh, of, the, of each of the proposed alternatives uh, with a lot of realism and do it quick on a project schedule and turn this around so that we weren't talking about months of effort here. These, we're talking about a very short period of time, hours and days uh, to go from a simple representation of the notch to a full flow field and an estimate of entrainment. Um, we did this for a number of different uh, structures and part of this was made possible by recent advances in the Department of Defense on how we build computational meshes. Um, and so the so-called capstone is a, is a program in the Department of Defense to make computational models. Uh, it's not intended for rivers and fish, they thought that was kind of humorous, but, uh, but it worked, it worked for us. And it gave us the ability to do something that we couldn't do before. Um, the modeling procedure, I'll just won't bore you too many details. It, it was pretty straightforward. Our spatial domain was from Knight's Landing down to Verona. Uh, and so we released fish at Knight's Landing. We counted how many went through at Verona. And then we counted how many went through each notch. And we did that for every stage and every alternative that was required by the project. Um, we developed ensembles of each condition with multiple runs. So you can think of these as you know, a way to kind of look at the variability that was inherent in our model outcomes. Uh, you, you all saw the last time I was here talking about this, uh, the hurricanes were active in the Gulf. And so you all were all looking at spaghetti models and we produced something very similar to that. Um, that basically helps you understand the variability that, with, that's inherent within the model. Um, the behavior rule was pretty straightforward. It was swim downstream at one and a half body lengths per second um, and the movement path was just a very old uh, bias random walk type style to, uh, that allows us to represent some randomness in the movement and capture the speed. And, um, and then that was run across all the alternatives and all the scenarios. And so here's an example of our base condition. This is our calibration step basically. And you can see that the, the, there's a lot of overlap between the, the um, modeled and measured data. Uh, there's a lot of nuances in this and uh, you know they have to do with the way the data is collected, the limitations of, of the data. I think one of the, the big ones to keep in mind is that we're still working, I know everybody hears this every presentation, but we're working with large hatchery fish and we're interested in small wild fish. It's an interesting thing to consider and, and keep in mind with these results because uh, 
I'm not sure how they would necessarily change. Uh, there's, and it's hard to, to put data on that. So it is an uncertainty, but by and large, uh, despite the complexities of the site, uh, we were able to represent the spatial distribution very well. One caveat, we did this during a low stable flow in the system. Um, subsequently, uh, the, the follow on year, uh, more measurements were taken over a wider range of flows and including up to and overtopping the weir. Um, spatial distribution stayed relatively constant despite changes in, in stage and discharge out there until you got over the weir. Then things changed a lot. Um, so again, it, compared to some parts of the river, that stretch of the river is relatively uh, straightforward. Um, just an example, some of the output from the model, the model versus the measured speed over ground, that's what the, the data looks. What you see is, is that the model is a little less variable than maybe the speed over ground in terms of outliers, but the averages were very close. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. And this was done very quickly. There wasn't a lot of tuning or calibration required to capture this. It, uh, the 2D models were good, and that helps make this process uh, move well. And then finally, after you put all that information together, you, you produce a graph like this, and this is this is your entrainment rates. Uh, some of the some of the interesting things that I saw that came out of this that I thought were really useful. Um, some of them were obvious. Uh, bigger notches, bigger flows, and train lots more fish. So you see that with that orange line at the top. Um, and the opposite is true as well. And so if you're going to make a notch that's really small, you're, you can you can anticipate getting relatively few fish. Um, the notches that were between three and 6,000 CFS, the ones that were in the middle, show a lot of overlap. And um, you see that when the, when the stages are relatively low, all of these are about equal. They begin to show a little differentiation as you, as you get out to the higher stages. And indeed, some of them even drop off in effectiveness. Uh, and that has to do with um, the changes in fish distribution in the model as it relates to overbank flow. So when you top over the channel be, but before you're over the weir, the hydraulics of the system change a lot and you're getting some of that captured in this, in this approach. Um, this is just one aspect of a, of a project plan, right? There's other things that are gonna influence how these notches are chosen. The entrainment is not the only factor. It may not even be the most important factor. I actually don't know. Um, but there are other things that everybody that's ever implemented a project knows you're gonna have to consider. Things like maintenance and cost and operations and, and uh, other factors that inevitably creep into these analysis. So this becomes one piece. And that is one thing that Brian always does a good job of highlighting is that there are multiple ways to get at information. This is just one step out of many steps that potentially could be used. It's not the, the only, only step, but it does fit nicely when you're asking infrastructure related questions. And when I say infrastructure, I'll include things like habitat features that are being built in the channel and such. Um, Validation is a tricky, a tricky thing on a system you know, like this, mainly because you know, we don't have a, a really good notch to compare this to, but we do have a, a lot of distributaries in the system that have had entrainment rates measured in them. Uh, Georgiana Slew being chief among them, but there are others. Uh, and there are a couple of papers out there that roll up the entrainment rates at those sites as a function of, of flow. So if you just plot flow as a ratio, entraining flow to river flow as a ratio, I was able to put them on the same axis as our proposed notches at at Fremont Weir, and you know what it suggests to me is one: our notches are small in comparison to some of the flows you deal with in your distributaries in the system. Uh, the, the very biggest notch, 12,000 CFS, begins to get up into the range that you would expect uh, entrainment rates to be at, at some of the like places like Georgiana Slough, for example. But by and large, uh, we trend very well um, uh, with with the observed data in the system suggesting that we're neither overestimating or grossly underestimating what the potential benefits of this, of this notch might be. I found this to be, to be comforting, uh, even though uh, there are a lot of ways that a person might have gone about it. This was a straightforward and simple way and took advantage of existing system knowledge. Um, so caveats, um, you know, one thing I like to think about is it's a planning study and so we're all technical people. What does accuracy and precision mean in a planning study? You know, we don't have data at the site to compare to, and so what are we trying to quantify? Uh, the answer to that's complicated, maybe not even uh, widely accepted, uh, but it's something to think about because, again, I want to emphasize this was a planning exercise. Uh, it was not a, a scientific, directly a scientific investigation or, or engineering and design. 
was intended to help us understand the, the gross system characteristics that might influence how a notch gets built. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the simplified behavior with hatchery fish. Um, one thing that um, I think is interesting is that, you know, more flow does seem to entrain more fish, but it also highlights, we also can highlight examples where structure location, structure shape, and orientation matter. Um, you know, I think we're, there's an example where we can probably get a, a four or five percent extra entrainment just by making simple engineering changes to the structure. And that insight was gained through going through this process. Um, I have no doubt that depending on which alternative is ultimately selected and goes forward for design, that that'll be further uh, evaluated and understood. Um, another thing I think is just, it's out there. When you build the notch, you're gonna change the flow field. So all the observed behaviors that we see in the river now may no longer really apply all that much. And in fact, the notch is going to create a very strong local velocity gradient. Uh, you can imagine you're gonna speed the water up. And that's something that fish are gonna respond to. And so you may induce some behavior that is either beneficial or not, depending on how the fish behave. And we don't have a lot of that kind of information on the river at this point. So it's, it's something to be, to be aware of, and that will come about as we, as we do construction and post-project evaluation. Um, some lessons, I think, broad, broad lessons that I, I drew from this. Um, you know, always keep in mind the difference between planning and engineering design. Uh, multiple team approaches are good. There's lots of ways to get at information for something like this. But it's, it would be better if we could get everybody's um, projects that are working on something like this synced up so that we were all contributing at the same time and the, with clear objectives. Um, that, that's a challenge because because projects start and end for various reasons, but you know, it, it produced some, some challenges for us just in getting through the workflow. Um, and I wanna leave you with the fact that we were able to, to develop multiple alternatives very quickly and produce information about their entrainment potential almost on a day-by-day -day scale. Um, you know, we've gotten really good at implementing our workflow and so when you're thinking about implementing projects and infrastructure, uh, it, it's easy to fall into a, a, a workflow where you're saying, well, we're gonna do modeling and, and in six months we'll get an answer or a year we'll get an answer. But what I have found is, is that when you're on a project schedule, uh, that almost daily feedback is really critical. Um, a, lot of, a lot of projects like to, to make changes and say, tell me what the answer is and make another change. Tell me what the answer is. So being able to, to do this quickly was something that I think we showed, but I wasn't sure we were gonna be able to do. But it, again, it comes about by stepping back and looking at the system and saying, what do we need to describe everything 2D because we couldn't implement 3D quickly, uh, not like that. And, and how do we represent all of these alternatives? Well, we, we have to figure out how to integrate uh, the computational mesh process into this workflow very quickly. Um, this could work for any number of styles of infrastructure projects. Uh, uh, again, depending on the style and nature of the question. So uh, with that, I would say that, you know, we had a big team and as always, it's, it's my pleasure to be able to represent them. I'm by far and away, not the only person working on this kind of stuff. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for your time. necessarily my, my area of expertise, so um, there may be somebody on the phone or, uh, or even in the audience here that, that could answer that better, but I, my understanding is, is it's not that good. Um, there, are some, there are some focus studies on um, different types of habitat, and, 
and predation, but as far as I know, there hasn't been a comprehensive study that's, that's you know, documented really well um, how predation changes with different types of habitat with respect to salmonid survival. I think um, we had one. Did you? I asked what happened next. What happens? Um, in relation to the Fremont Weir? Um, so the, the, the EIS, EIR is, is going to be released soon. Um, you know, that process will unfold at, at the rate that it unfolds. I, you know, I'm not sure of the schedule at this point. Um, you know, it's going to, if, if they get to a selection, you know, the, the, the goal here is to get a notch built. Um, and, you know, if that process gets underway, there'll be engineering design. There might be more focused studies, perhaps some 3D modeling that would happen, you know, for that notch. Um, and uh, hopefully construction and post evaluation to see if we really were close or not. You talked about the importance of uh, working in other teams and coordinating your efforts with others. Can you talk a little bit about the practical aspects of that? Uh, you, you, you mentioned briefly uh, different studies on different budgets with different objectives. How do you practically incorporate what you're doing to help inform what other people are doing? Uh, I, think, I think the only way you can do it is, is our meetings like this and, and, and constant coordination. Uh, you know, the reality is, is that it's, it's hard to get a project off the ground and funded and moving forward, data being collected and so forth. And uh, I, I'm always surprised how difficult it is, even when teams have similar interests and objectives um, and there's plenty of resources, how difficult it is to get everything synced up. And it, it just has, there's a lot of things I think that are not under the control of the project, right? You know, we, we work on a project, but we all come from different organizations that have different timelines and rules and expectations. Um, some of that may not be uh, controllable. Uh, you, you, but I, I, it's worth drawing out because uh, this project is a great, is a, is a wonderful uh, idea, you know, I think it's got a lot of potential to do some good. Um, getting more ideas uh, into it was was welcome and, and and important, but for for those other reasons, it just it didn't it didn't come to its total fruition. In part because we we couldn't get everything synced up. Not not yet. We're working on it, but I think every project probably has that to deal with. Not not to push it off too much or anything. <laughs> So one issue with this project is what it does to the Yolo Bypass in terms of uh, the value and frequency of uh, inundation and what that does to uh, agricultural expectations in the area. Can you talk a little bit about how your modeling relates to uh, illustrating those impacts and and to describe how that impacts the viability of the project. We provided entrainment estimates, which would be could be converted into numbers of fish that could then be passed to uh, a model of the of the bypass. And and in fact, the the, pro the project did produce such a tool. Uh, it's not being described today. It was I, I didn't lead that effort. Do you want to talk to it or no? So. Uh, so this is Josh Israel, and David's right. Um, he really just looked at the question of fisheries and trainment, and we had multiple models that did that. And we had a Delta Science Program independent review panel look at a number of different models that were used, and there was one that looked at agricultural economics under the six different alternatives that are going to be presented in the draft public EIS EIR. But there is also a sort of population model that looks at Chinook salmon and uses other uh, hydrologic tool models and, and things and other relationships to look at other phenomena that we wanted to know about. So, And then there's also a waterfowl model. We wanted to evaluate that too. 
information. I, I had a question, you know, so clearly in, uh, the flow is a big part of entrainment, but given that you identified that there are other potential factors like behavior, did you do any sensitivity analysis to see like if, if you, behavior is different, how big of an effect is it gonna have on overall entrainment? And then sort of as a follow-up, <laughs> If you could, if you could do, had more time and you could develop the model further, what additional data would be most beneficial to to improve estimates? If it's not behavior, what else are the other sure. issues? So the uh, you know currently uh, you know the data does not really suggest that there's a lot of evidence that there's other behavior other than the swim downstream, with some with some fine caveats there. Um, I mean the data is always limited and so forth. Um, having said that, uh, this is not part of the analysis, but we do have, uh, you know, analysis for smaller fish, uh, and we do have some initial uh, behavior thresholds. The, the challenge I have is, is that without evidence of the fish, uh, you know, reacting to a, to a velocity field, um, it's hard to know where to set the threshold. And this isn't just at our site. I mean, we've, the Corps has collected data just upstream from here for a number of years, and uh, we see the same the same broad trends. Is that you know we're we were interested in getting fish to stay on the banks and rear. The Corps has been building features in the river for a number of years as part of their mitigation effort, um, and uh, we we don't see a lot of evidence that we can induce a fish to stick around. Um, and uh, part of that is uh, there's a lot of reasons I think that that, that exists, but the point is, is that we're not seeing any kind of a, a behavior. So I've been I've been a little more careful and circumspect about running that forward. Having said that, a follow-on study, just specifically where you say, look, we're going to look at the range of possible thresholds that induces behavior and see what the out how the outcomes change. What what I think goes on there is, is that because you're inducing a strong velocity gradient with the notch, you're going to see for migrating fish a tendency for them to shy away from it. Um, so then it becomes a question of whether you captured them enough in the flow field to just draw them through. And so um, I think that's a worthwhile question to look at, and it's consistent with what we see with uh, notches of a similar size in Pacific Northwest. Um, so I, having, and having said that, you asked the second part of your question was what additional data? Um, you know, if you're, if you're asking me to make a wish, I'd like to see some small fish, you know, and um, everybody would like to see it. The Corps is interested in this uh, for their own mitigation projects. Um, some way to document where you know the 30, 40, 50 millimeter fish are hanging out in the river as they come through that reach would be uh, useful because we just we just don't know. I mean, it's just the data does not exist, and um, it's for obvious reasons. It's it's probably really hard to get. Um, um, I I can add a little bit. So, um, with respect to engineering uh, uh, engineering uh, barriers at junctions, um, it becomes necessary to know what the real hydrodynamic phenomena is that the fish are responding to, so that the engineers can optimize it, you know, maximize that that phenomena. And so, one of our hypotheses is that, um, with like the at the very beginning slide, there was the picture of the of the barrier at Georgiana Slough with the orange buoys. Um, our working hypothesis was that the fish were responding to a boundary layer across that um, that 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 barrier, <clears throat> and um, but we don't really know. It's it's really difficult to take um, that fine a scale hydrodynamic measurements that close to a structure, and um, so actually, as we speak, um, we're uh, my group from the Bay Delta office is in the process of using of piloting a thermal camera um, to try to get some of these really fine scale hydrodynamic. Phenomena, which then you know, if we can, if we're successful with this measurement technique, potentially we could use that to calibrate um, calibrate a model and then start to evaluate you know real acoustic telemetry behavior or real acoustic telemetry data against um, modeled fish behavior and start to work on some of these hypotheses. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about um, you have all these many people on your acknowledgments page who are from many different agencies, and I'm curious about the history of how all these people came together and how it worked to be working so much across agencies. That, that's actually, I'll let Dave answer that, but that's a great clarification. Um, so 
I wasn't. I personally wasn't involved with the with the Fremont Weir Yolo Bypass project. I've been working on other ELAM related projects with with uh, Dave. So we we're using similar tools, um, but for for different projects. So I'll let Dave talk answer your question specifically. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, this 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 is one of these things that you know we started working in the Bay Delta area uh, with for the Corps of Engineers related to levees. And um, that's when I started meeting people, people like Brian and people like uh, Josh and others. And you know, there was obviously interest in in, in more integration with with ongoing you know thinking in the in the area. And so we've just been slowly building up. Um, we we in this particular case, you know, the core had some capability to help do work in the field, and it matched well with what people could do from the bureau and and um, and and. But, you know, we we ended up building quite a big team just to implement it. It, it. I won't say it was easy, but it didn't. It wasn't any more than a weekly phone call that lasted three hours. You know, to get everything planned, and uh, and and I think Roy was on those phone calls, uh, as I recall. So there was a lot of people, and and but in the end, uh, just takes some coordination. Yeah. Last chance for any more questions. Well, uh, On, uh, on the last piece of this acknowledgement slide, there's something called the Fisheries Engineering Technical Team, which is a technical team that was chartered as part of the EIS EIR team for the Yolo Bypass RPA. And it basically was a group of agency biologists, scientists, and engineers who were looking for ways to analyze the project about five years ago. And we described a number of different modeling approaches that we thought might be valuable and looked at what we wanted to get out of the models and what kind of phenomena and processes we wanted to evaluate based on the management questions that we had, which we thought were sort of going to characterize the alternatives. And so that's how we ended up with uh, going with the ELAM model, we wanted something that could use a fish behavioral approach. We also developed this population model with Kramer Fish Science that looked at giving us information about the number of adults that would return as an important metric because one of the management questions was how this would contribute to benefiting the winter run Chinook salmon and other Chinook salmon populations. And so um, we basically evaluated a bunch of different approaches and didn't select all of them, but selected a couple of them to try to create a set of outputs that we could compare and contrast. And um, luckily, most of them have sort of lined up nicely and there's some trends and not a lot of conflict amongst the results of those models. But it took a, probably more than a year to sort of charter that group through the EISCIR process and, and end up then being able to fund some of these projects in the field and then fund some of these projects that would use that field information for the modeling and alternative evaluation. And you know, with that answer, the question about how do you sync up people, I mean, that, that highlights the difficulty. Um, it's not like somebody can just snap their fingers and make a project happen. So uh, with any particular tool or approach. But, I was just wondering, what would it take to get that small fish data that you're hoping for? Is that doable or not doable with current technology? The only technology that I think, well, there's maybe two approaches that could work. You could implement a hydroacoustic type approach um, that maybe would allow you to represent uh, fish. I mean, the trade-off there is you don't really know what you're looking at sometimes, and so you'd have to control for that somehow. You might also be able to do pit tags, and this has been tried elsewhere. Um, you know, we've we've prototyped some ideas. We've got no further than this, where you know you might be able to lay out, say, like a, an inside bend is where we were thinking about it. Um, lay out a, a pit tag detection array that would lie on the bottom, um, and would be spaced every so often, and and then you would purposely um, introduce small fish, hatchery fish, um, above it that, that have been tagged with a pit a pit tag, and and keep track of where and how long they hang out someplace. It's possible. Um, so those are the two technologies I think that would you know work. Uh, we've tried electrofishing 
for the core, you know, uh, for a number of years. We've, we've got data for that, and we've got so few small, so few salmonids in general, they just aren't on the banks. And, uh, and so you could potentially fish them up that way. Maybe you could capture them with uh, trawl nets or sayings or something like that too, but we just don't find a lot of evidence that they're spending time on the banks. Um, so I think it's something else would have to be used. But I, this is, I mean, there's bound to be some other smart people that could figure this out. I, but that's, that's the way I would probably approach it. I think I'm leaning towards pit tags as, a, as an initial study. Thank you very much.